My name's Emily, and I've always thought of Snapchat as a fun way to share moments with friends. Little did I know that it would become the center of a disturbing incident that unfolded right in my hometown of Logansport. It all started innocently enough. One day, I received a friend request on Snapchat from someone I didn't recognize. Curiosity got the better of me, and I accepted the request. The username was kflowers24, and the profile picture showed a guy who looked about my age. I figured he was just a friend of a friend or someone from the local community. Soon enough, kflowers24 sent me a message. Hey, how's it going? He asked. I replied with a simple, good, you? Little did I know that this seemingly casual conversation would take a dark turn. As we chatted, Kflowers24 became increasingly persistent, asking personal questions that made me uncomfortable. Red flags started popping up, and I began to feel uneasy. What's your favorite thing to do for fun, he asked. I hesitated but replied with a generic answer, trying to keep the conversation light. Days passed, and the messages from Kflowers24 became more explicit. He started sending inappropriate photos and asking for similar pictures in return. I was shocked and disgusted. I immediately blocked him, thinking that would be the end of it. But the nightmare was just beginning. One evening, as I was scrolling through Snapchat, I noticed a news story from the Longsport Police Department. The headline sent shivers down my spine. Logan Sportman arrested for soliciting child porn over social media. As I read further, I discovered that the man arrested was none other than Keegan M. Flowers, the person behind the K Flowers 24 Snapchat account. My heart raced as I realized that I had unwittingly become a part of the disturbing incident. The police had traced his activities back to me, and they needed my cooperation to build their case against Flowers. I hesitated, unsure of how involved I wanted to be in this unsettling situation. However, a sense of responsibility prevailed, and I decided to help the authorities in any way I could. Detectives from the Logansport Police Department reached out to me, and we arranged to meet at the police station. The officers were professional and understanding, making me feel as comfortable as possible given the circumstances. I appreciate your cooperation, Detective Anderson said, his tone reassuring. Your information will be crucial in ensuring that justice is served. As I provided details about my interactions with Kflowers24, the detectives assured me that I had done the right thing by reporting the inappropriate messages. They explained that these cases required the cooperation of individuals like me to ensure the safety of the community. A few weeks later, armed with the information I provided, the Logansport police, along with assistance from local law enforcement, traveled to Norwalk, Ohio, where Flowers lived. The Snapchat messages had led them straight to his doorstep. A sense of closure washed over me when I received the news of Flowers' arrest. The police executed a search warrant at his home, collecting further evidence to strengthen their case. It was a relief to know that the threat had been removed, at least for the time being. But the investigation was far from over. The authorities hinted at the possibility of additional charges, suggesting that Flowers might have been involved in more sinister activities than initially thought. As the legal proceedings unfolded, I couldn't shake off the feeling of vulnerability that came with being a part of this story. It made me realize the importance of staying vigilant online and reporting any suspicious behavior. The internet, including platforms like Snapchat, can be a double-edged sword, a place for connection and sharing, but also a breeding ground for predators. In the midst of this ordeal, I received a call from Detective Anderson. Emily, your cooperation has been instrumental in this case, he said. 
Your willingness to speak up has helped us protect others from potential harm. I thanked him, though my mind was still grappling with the aftermath of the entire situation. The Logansport community had been shaken by this incident. A stark reminder that danger could lurk in unexpected places, even within the confines of seemingly harmless social media platforms. In the following weeks, life slowly returned to normal, but the impact of the incident lingered. The local news continued to cover the unfolding legal proceedings, shedding light on the severity of Flower's actions and the potential consequences he might face. One day, as I was browsing through Snapchat, I came across a public service announcement from the local sport police department. The headline caught my eye. Staying safe on Snapchat, tips to protect yourself online. It was a reminder that vigilance and awareness were crucial in navigating the digital landscape. In the midst of this online safety campaign, I received a Snapchat notification. It was a message from Detective Anderson. Hey Emily, just wanted to check in and see how you're doing. Your courage in coming forward has made a difference. I replied expressing my gratitude for the support I had received from both the police and the community. Detective Anderson encouraged me to share my story, emphasizing the importance of raising awareness about online safety and the responsibility each user holds in reporting suspicious activities. In the end, the Logansport community emerged stronger, more aware, and committed to creating a digital space where everyone could feel safe. The Snapchat incident had left its mark, but it also sparked a collective effort to safeguard the well-being of all those who called Logansport home. As I close the chapter on this unsettling episode, I couldn't help but feel a sense of empowerment. My willingness to speak up had contributed to a safer community, proving that, even in the face of darkness, the collective strength of individuals could illuminate the path to justice and protection. Hey guys, thanks so much for all the support. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please feel free to do so. Hi, my name is Luna. I've always been a bit of a loner. My friend, Emily, suggested that I should join Snapchat to connect with people and maybe make some new friends. At first, I was hesitant, but I thought, why not give it a try? I created my Snapchat account and started sharing snippets of my life. It was fun, and I felt a bit less lonely. Soon I began posting educational videos, just like my friend Clara did. The response was overwhelming, and I started gaining followers. One day, I noticed a new message in my inbox. It was from an unknown ID. Hey Luna, you're amazing. I love your videos, the message read. At first I was excited that someone appreciated my content, but soon the tone changed. I want to be with you, Luna. I can't stop thinking about you. The messages turned creepy. I felt a chill down my spine. Was this a joke? I decided to block the unknown ID, thinking it was just a prank. But the messages didn't stop. They came from different IDs, each one more explicit and unsettling than the last. I felt scared, and the thought of someone watching me sent shivers down my spine. I made the tough decision to close my Snapchat account, hoping that would put an end to the disturbing messages. Little did I know, my troubles were far from over. One day, as I was walking home, a student approached me, handing over a letter. This is from an uncle who asked me to give it to you, the child said before walking away. I opened the letter, and my heart sank. I told you that you can't escape from me. Even though you closed your Snapchat account, I will still possess you. The words were chilling, and I panicked. I rushed home, locked myself in my room, and spent the night in fear. The next day, I confided in my boyfriend, Mike. 
He comforted me and suggested reporting the incident to the police. But the idea of going through all that seemed overwhelming. Mike understood and decided that I should leave my job and come with him. He became my protector, dropping me off and picking me up from my new workplace. For a while, things seemed calm, and the nightmare of those messages faded away. But peace is often fleeting. One day, Mike couldn't pick me up due to heavy rain. I decided to walk alone, hoping to find a taxi quickly. As I entered a dark tunnel, the sound of footsteps behind me intensified. Fear gripped me, and I couldn't bring myself to turn around. Suddenly, a man grabbed me from behind, covering my mouth. I screamed, but the sound was muffled. I couldn't run. His grip was too tight. Panic set in, and just as I thought it couldn't get worse, police sirens echoed in the distance. The man released me and fled. Relieved, I saw the police jeep stop in front of me. Are you okay? A thief is on the loose, and we're looking for him, the police explained. I couldn't find the words to share my own terrifying encounter, overwhelmed by anxiety. They called a taxi, and I reached home safely. Mike and I decided it was time to leave the city behind. Now we live in New York City, far away from the haunting memories of that incident. Strangely, the unknown messages stopped after we moved. Reflecting on that moment, I wonder if the man in the tunnel was the same person from Snapchat or just a random thief. The fear still lingers, but at least in a new city I feel a bit safer. A few months later, I cautiously decided to give social media another chance. I created a new Snapchat account, hoping for a fresh start. This time, I kept my circle small, connecting with only close friends and family. One day, as I was scrolling through my Snapchat feed, I came across a message from an unfamiliar username. Hey Luna, your videos are fantastic. Keep up the good work, the message read. My heart skipped a beat. Was this another unsettling encounter waiting to happen? I hesitated, but decided to respond with caution. Thank you. I appreciate it, I replied. The message has remained friendly and supportive, and I started to feel a sense of relief. Maybe not everyone on social media was a potential threat. I continued sharing my content, gaining a small but genuine following. One evening, as I was about to log off, a message popped up. I really enjoy your Snapchat stories. They brighten up my day, a follower expressed. Encouraged by the positive feedback, I replied, I'm glad you like them. It's nice to connect with people who appreciate the content. As weeks passed, my Snapchat experience turned into a positive one. I built a small community of followers who shared common interests and passions. The fear that once haunted me started to fade, replaced by a sense of belonging. One day I received a message from a follower I had interacted with frequently. Hey, I'm organizing a meetup with some Snapchat friends, would you like to join us? The invitation surprised me, but after some thought, I agreed. It was an opportunity to meet people who would become more than just usernames on a screen. The day of the meetup arrived, and I nervously entered the designated location. To my relief, everyone was friendly, and we spent the day sharing stories, laughter, and building genuine connections. As the sun set, one of the attendees said, This has been amazing. We should do it again sometime. I smiled, realizing that my perspective on social media had changed. It wasn't just a platform for potential dangers. It could also be a place for positive connections and friendships. In the end, my Snapchat journey took a turn for the better. The fear that once paralyzed me transformed into an understanding that not everyone online is a threat. Sometimes, all it takes is a fresh start and a small, supportive community to change one's perspective. Back when I was a teenager, me and my brother were absolutely obsessed with fishing. We still enjoy the occasional trip all these years later. 
Don't get me wrong. But back then, we lived and breathed river fishing. So much so that we used to participate in fishing tournaments and therefore had to take part in training sessions every other day. Spoilers, but these training sessions were just an excuse to get some time in by the river. And I won't bore you with how the fishing tournaments work. So just take our word that we fished an awful lot. Anyway, I was like 13 years old. It was September. And me and my brother were fishing down at this river bend out in the sticks. Now, you gotta keep in mind that in river and lake fishing, you gotta be quiet as a mouse unless you scare the fish away. So as the skies darkened, this low rumbling of thunder echoed around the sky. Well, you can imagine how creepy that was. We're expecting rain, but that doesn't mean we're going to stop fishing. And it has to take much more than that to scare us off. And cue the appearance of some creepy stranger who walks out of the woods on the other side of the river. He doesn't have any gear with him besides the rod. But he's got a fishing hat on one that has all his scraggly gray hair tumbling out from under it. We try to wave hi, but he just gives us this look as if to say, you're in my spot. And me and my brother are getting ready to pack up if he asks us, because God knows people can get really territorial about their favorite spot being crept on. But the guy doesn't say anything and he just walks about a hundred yards upstream and starts fishing up there. All right, he was kind of choking off our spot. But we were never ones to back away from a challenge, so we stayed put. As we're fishing, the thunder and lightning get louder and louder, and the gaps between them shorter and shorter, meaning it's slowly traveling right above our heads. I end up looking upstream to see if the grumpy old dude is still there. And he is. But then I notice how his rod is bending and doesn't sit right with me. It looks nice and strong, but way too flexible to be anything other than carbon fiber. At least, that was my guess. But here's the thing. Although you don't think of carbon fiber as being metal, it's super conductive to electricity. Meaning, if this guy really was using a carbon fiber rod, it wasn't so much a fishing rod as a lightning rod. I remember whispering to my brother like, think that guy's using carbon fiber? To which he replies, <laughs> he's old, is that Tom? Look at the way the things bend though, I remember saying. My brother looks again, and that's when he sees what I'm seeing. And then out of nowhere, this huge crack and flash let us know that we've just been within 100 yards of a lightning strike that impacted really close to our grumpy fishing guy. We get up and just hightail it over to where he was standing. And there's this guy's rod laying there in the dirt smoking. We started looking around for the guy to see if he was okay, but we couldn't find anything. Not a single trace of this dude. But then my brother finds one of the guy's boots lying near the road of the tree that's smoking too. And that's when he looks up. We finally find where the guy went. The lightning had blown this poor sob right up into a tree. We bailed to the nearest gas station to call the EMTs, but by that time, the guy was long dead. And there was no saving him. This was a long time ago, and a memory that stuck with me for a long time, and it was truly very hard to get back into fishing after that. But of all the freaky occurrences that kind of came out of that, the one thing that really stuck with me was the smell in the air when we finally found him. It honestly smelled like barbecue pork. You know what Bitmoji stories are, right? They're AI stories created on Snapchat you make with your Bitmoji character. Subscribe to the Bitmoji Stories channel, and there you go your daily Bitmoji stories, featuring you as the main lead. Every Snapchat user gets the same story as others, 
It's just that the characters that they are and the person they had last a conversation with or snap spree with. Okay, so here's my story. I got the second hand phone from a repair shop after losing my previous one. I did not have enough money and my parents denied buying me a new phone after just a few months. So I took all my savings allowance and was only able to afford a second hand device. It did not look half bad, the camera quality was also good and so I immediately installed Snapchat on the device. I was obsessed with Snapchat even on my previous phone and I have already subscribed to Bitmoji stories on all my Snapchat. After upgrading the phone's outer cover by adding a few of the latest designs, it was finally ready for me to use. That day during the recess, when I opened my Snapchat and was scrolling through it, I opened the Bitmoji stories. And it was a bit weird that instead of my last interactive person, the story was in the fifth person. The story started with me focusing on my phone in the cafeteria and walking towards the staircase when I bumped into that girl. And she falls down the chair. As I was focused on watching the story, I bumped into someone. I looked over and noticed the same girl who was my fifth interaction on Snapchat. And she had fallen down the stairs after bumping into me. She did not look like she was seriously injured, but I still apologized. It felt a bit weird to me, but I thought, it must just be a coincidence. I went back to class and asked my friend Jenny to show me her Bitmoji stories, and to my surprise, it was completely different from mine. After that, I checked a few more people's Bitmoji stories, but everyone had the same one, except for me. I could not understand what was going on, so I waited for the next story. The next story that I got was normal as everyone else's. So I thought, it really must be a coincidence, and I was just thinking way too much about it. Afterwards, I forgot about that incident and continued to live my life normally. But one day, when I checked the stories, it was with a person who was at the bottom of my interaction list. The stories showed me walking home with a grocery bag in my hand and stopping near the red light when he sees me and for some reason starts rushing towards me when he gets into an accident with a biker. I was in my home at the time and to avoid this incident from happening, I sneaked out of my home and went to the park where I met Emily and started chatting. In the middle of my conversation with Emily, I completely forgot about the story and when my mom called me and asked me to bring some stuff from the supermarket, I agreed. As I was walking home after buying the stuff mom asked for, I saw David walking in the opposite direction as me, near the traffic light. I noticed the light turning red and him noticing me. It immediately reminded me of the story so I started waving him to go away. But in response, he rushed towards me and at that same time, a biker who was about to run past the red light hit him. I, including other people present, rushed towards him. And as he was bleeding badly, David was rushed to the emergency room immediately. And I contacted his sister to inform her about this incident. That was when my phone's notification bell rang. I opened it and it took me directly to Bitmoji's stories from earlier. There was another page update which had me waving hands towards him. This incident freaked me out completely and I could not understand what was going on and what was wrong with Snapchat. I decided to not open these stories anymore, no matter what. So I did not open the next update. David was discharged after two days and he had a few bruises here and there and a wound near his shoulders. But there was not any serious or life-threatening injuries. But I still apologized to him for that. And in response, he told me that it was not my fault and that I should stop blaming myself. The next day as I was going to school, I accidentally stepped onto something and immediately realized that it was a snake. For some reason, it did not bite me and I was so freaked out that I didn't know what came over me, but I picked up the snake and threw it aside. A man was sitting over there and the snake got curled up on his leg and bit him. I panicked and hid. The people around him rushed him to the hospital, but I cannot stop thinking that it was all because of Bitmoji stories. I opened it only to see my story in which I'm walking and then stepping on a snake's tail. In the next few slides, it had it all, from me throwing the snake to it biting the man, and then me hiding afterwards. It scared me as hell. So I tried on installing Snapchat from my device, but for some reason it kept failing and did not uninstall. Instead of going to school, I rushed towards the repair shop and asked him to take the phone back. Surprisingly, they took it back without any questions and returned my money after deducting the 20% from me using it till now, of course. 
I decided to never use any secondhand device and to ask my parents to buy me a new one every time. As I was exiting the shop, I noticed a girl walking in with a broken phone in her hands. I hope she doesn't buy the secondhand phone. I don't know why, but this random thought crossed my mind as I saw her. <laughs>